Now we can go back into WBPP and have a nice tour of the script. So, to begin with, we have the panels in which we're going to load the information. So they, they don't look like they're changing as I flip through here, but they will once we have files. So this is a container for biases. This is the dark container, the flats. You will notice that some things are changing over here on the right. This information here is associated with this tab. So when you look at the lights tab, it looks completely different. So this information here is associated with the lights tab. Now to get the files into here, you add them. And this first button that I want to highlight, the Add Files button, seems like the obvious one to use, and it is. Um, however, it's only with the understanding that it's getting the information to add the files from the FITS headers. So if the FITS headers are incomplete, or they are in some way um, not properly done, for example, there sometimes people use two different softwares and they don't realize that uh, in one software the information is being written to the FITS header in a different way than another, it will load into WBPP differently, uh, and it's just getting that information from the headers. Now, if you want to be certain files go exactly to the panel that you know they should go to, then you press the other buttons. So if I wanted to load just biases, I would press this bias file, and it will whatever files I open that I highlight, they will only go into the bias panel. So I'm going to highlight these buttons in just a moment, but I want to add one more uh, explanation here for the last button, which is the Add Custom button. This button is what allows you to basically transform an image if the attributes of the image are not correct, or maybe they're just not existent, even if they might be correct, but they just might not exist. So as an example, sometimes you may want to specify that a kind of image is a flat field image, but you also need to specify the exposure time. And that information, none of that is in the FITS header. So you can force the files that you highlight to be of a particular type. And then if it's a monochrome camera, you can specify a filter name, uh, but then you can specify the exposure time, uh, whatever it might be for that particular flat field image. And that's how you can cast any images you want to be of a particular type with a particular set of attributes. You use the Add Custom button. I will be demonstrating that later, uh, but for the moment know that that's a powerful button and not to forget about it. Um, it's very useful to take advantage of. So without any further ado, I'm just going to load files and demonstrate the two ways that files can be loaded. Let me demonstrate the, the very straightforward way, which is I'm going to add biases by navigating to a place here on my computer. And I'm just going to show you an example, because you'll see why in a moment, where I have all of the data, everything, biases, darks, flats, and actual you know, pictures of space. It's all in one directory here, OK? So if I wanted to get the biases, you know, I can find where they are in here, and uh, I can highlight them. But they could be scattered around in this big directory that I happen to be in. So this is a reminder. Uh, this is something that I point out in Fast Track, but I really hope that everyone takes it to heart. If you don't know where all the files are in a particular directory and you don't want to try to highlight them in some way, you can always use the wildcard characters in a, a file open dialog, such as we are here. I can just type star bias star and only those files that have the word bias in it are going to show up. That way, now I know um, that these will be the only ones I'm opening, and they're going to go into the panel that I say. So if I say add darks, now I don't need a switch here. When I say add darks, it'll put it in the darks panel. Let's just demonstrate that. So now I don't know what I called my darks. Oh, they're just called dark. So I do star dark star. And these are all dark frames, but they are different. They have different times, which uh, are an attribute to the data. So when I throw them in there, you'll see that here we have the darks panel um, and we have different groups of darks because it's grouping them by exposure time. So here we are in the 600 seconds and then I have 90 second exposures and then I have 60 second exposures for whatever reason. 
um, I have all the darks. Same thing for flats. You can load flats here. So star flat star. No, not star. Yeah, star flat star. Sorry. So these should load in the flats, and here they are now grouped um, by filter, which is uh, a little bit different because my flats, the flats that I took, and I'll explain about this later, they have different exposure times. Um, there is a method today that most imagers are using CMOS cameras, and so they would have to match what are called flat darks with each of the exposure times for their flats, and I'll explain all about that shortly enough. There's another method where you can just apply a single bias to calibrate all these data, but it depends on your sensor, and uh, that's where I'm going to save that for later. That's why it's grouped like this, though. These are all blue frames, but they have slightly different, I mean, look at the times, they're very, very similar, slightly different exposure times. These are, that's a, actually a scientific filter, a Sloan G, there's the green, and so on. So I have all these filter groups here loaded. And then if I add lights, lights actually will just be the object. Uh, so TMC, Taurus Molecular Cloud, for those that are curious. So I've added them now into the lights. Now I'd like to point out uh, just a couple of features here. When you load the information into a panel, uh, this stuff that it says right at the top, those are the image attributes that are important for matching purposes. So for example, this is the exposure time, and we're going to want, potentially, to have a dark frame of the same exposure time as maybe a light frame. So that might be part of the calibration process. We also want uh, a flat field that is taken through the blue filter. This happens to be monochrome data. I'll show you other data soon enough. But I should have somewhere in this list blue flats. I don't know where they are. Oh, they're right at the top. Blue flats. So the blue here is going to match the light blue here. So we know that there's going to be a matching between uh, flats and light. So that's good. Darks, of course, are just going to say the exposure time. And binning is the, um, if you're grouping pixels or not, uh, to bin them. The un unbinned is basically binning of one. And biases. Yeah, the only difference would really be if you change the camera, but you don't distinguish that, at least not in the panel here. Now, when we load these files by raw biases, raw darks, raw flats, th what WBPP is going to do is it's going to create master files from these lists of files. It'll create masters of them. And those masters are going to be used then to calibrate data. The creation of the masters, though, is what we're, that's what this information is about over here on the right. So biases, for example, it takes advantage of image integration, the process that I showed earlier. And in general, when most people are using the tool, they keep all of this stuff automatic. Now, you can, you can do a manual thing here. You can specify exactly uh, for the purposes of creating a master for biases here. You can specify the, the way in which you want uh, the rejection algorithm to take place or the combination type and, uh, you know, and some of the parameters here. All of this stuff, by the way, I explain in detail in my, uh, in my instructional videos under fundamentals. I explain all about this stuff. But typically, what makes this script nice, especially for the creation of masters, is the auto settings are fine. Just leave it auto. It's good stuff. Darks are the same. You'll notice the panel here real, relatively unchanged except for the um, grouping that you can do as far as exposure tolerance is concerned, and I'll talk about that a little later. The flats, again, it's just image integration. So there's really very little difference. It seems at first that there's a complication here, but it's not complicated. Certainly not for biases, darks, and flats. Now, lights has some extra stuff. For lights, looking over here, um, uh, the extra things that you can do include applying cosmetic correction, which is to be able to use another process in PixInsight called cosmetic correction. You set it up and it needs to be available out here and that way you can select it. So I'm going to show you two things right now about WBPP. Thing number one is that this checkbox here that says save group uh, frame groups on exit 
It's checked here by default, and that's good. I'm going to take advantage of it right now. I'm going to exit, and I'm going to say, do I really want to exit? Yes, I do. Um, and that's that's actually a thing. Thing number one is that I can exit and go back in, and everything will be there. Everything will be the same. But I just want to demonstrate the use of cosmetic correction you can do in a number of different ways. Uh, but just so I can show it being loaded here, I'm going to go to cosmetic correction, C-O-S. There we go. And uh, this is monochrome data, so I'm not going to do the CFA. I'm going to say use auto detect, my favorite method, and just the uh, bright values, the hot sigma. That's it. I create a template, a process here. I can even give it a nice name, like cosmetic correction. And now when I go back into WBPP, Everything will still be there, but I can press the cool button right there. So now I'm taking advantage of it, and you'll see that I have now a dropdown where I can select the template that I just created. As I mentioned earlier, I am just taking advantage in this video of the main purpose of WBPP, which is the pre-processing. These functionalities here, of applying subframe weighting, which means that you're going to do image registration and ultimately image integration, is that uh, this goes beyond pre-processing. So I will certainly cover this later. That's where this extra functionality is. But for now, we'll keep it simple, and I won't talk about this only to mention as a tour, that this, of course, is where the information resides. These are the, the checkboxes that you need to turn on and off. And then finally, uh, over here on the right, there are global options. And I think now that in WBPP there's been this simplification, these global options pretty much uh, you're just going to want to have on. The uh, up bottom fits. This just means that the origin, the zero zero of the, the image is going to be at the top left. Uh, generate rejection maps. If you're taking advantage of this stuff, that's where that comes into play. If you're taking advantage of image integration, you can see uh, the rejection maps. Save the process log, I guess. I would always want to save the log because if you have a problem, uh, you'll want to look at it. So a log is generated that you can save or that will be saved to disk. So the last basic important thing that you're going to want to do as far as just setup is concerned is specify a place to save all of the files. So in the output directory, now I'm going to just pick some random place here. You'll notice that I already have things in here, but this would be the place that I would put it. So whatever it is that you decide, use your output directory. WBPP is going to make many subfolders that contain um, all of the various steps that you go through here to calibrate the data. And those files would be calibrated, well, yeah, calibrated and then cosmetically corrected, perhaps. It'll generate a folder for the masters. If you go beyond that, maybe you have one-shot color camera data. Um, it can be debayered, and so there's another folder for that. And then yet more folders for masters, say, um, or at least more files will be in the masters if you continue on and create uh, image-integrated images uh, beyond that. But it's really the the pre-processing part that I want to highlight here. I'll be demonstrating that later, and I just want to clue you into the idea that you'll want to very quickly, if you're not familiar with it, understand that framework of those, uh, those folders that are created. Once you know what those folders are, it's very easy to see uh, what happened and perhaps what didn't happen in the course of uh, the calibration of the information. Now there is this grouping of keywords. This is completely new, and this adds a very, very powerful functionality to, um, uh, to WBPT. Just fantastic. So I will certainly be going over that uh, later as well. And I guess we're going to do kind of the big reveal here by clicking on the control panel. But I'm looking at the bottom. Uh, you know that there's a reset button. We can reset, clear all this information. I'm not going to do that. There is also a diagnostics tab or a button, and I don't really want to click on it yet because in some sense, it only makes sense to click on it 
only after you've examined the control panel. So I'm going to show you the control panel now. Uh, but the functionality of the diagnostics is still the same as it once was. It's going to give you information. It'll speak to you about the configuration that you currently have. Uh, but that configuration is only going to be uh, communicated here in the control panel. So I just want to show this stuff first. And then when you hit this button, it'll actually make sense because it's going to echo everything that we see here. I am going to go into much more detail about the control panel shortly. Uh, I'm not going to do it all here, not as part of a tour, but I need to specify that you click on a group. So you'll see that images, all the raw data, just as we saw groups here, so we have like a flat, uh, these are lights, so these are 600 second blue, and I have a whole bunch of blues, right? So in the control panel, here are blues. It says I have 58 of them. That's a lot. <laughs> and uh, it's all grouped together in one line here. All of those 58, because they are truly grouped together. They're going to be calibrated in the same way. If I click on it, you get some more functionality over here at the right, which will all need to be explained. And you'll notice that in green, light up groups. Because what it's doing is it's associating the, the, the light frames in this case, with the calibration data that's going to be used. That is just spectacular. Look, we know that uh, the blue flats are going to be used to calibrate the blue data. Uh, the darks are going to be used to calibrate the data. And in this case, biases are also going to be in, in play because they are in play by a, necess a necessity uh, to be calibrating the flats. But all of this stuff is in play at the moment. And that's just really, really cool. So I'll go into much more detail about this. So I will explain about the uh, various configurations. I'm going to press the diagnostics button just so you can see a message. Um, I, I'm expecting to get a message here. Everything is actually correct, uh, but the message is going to be about the flats. The flats are, it's going to tell me that there are no master darks for the flats, which is true. And that's because the bias frame is going to be used to calibrate the flats. How do I know that? Because if I click on a flat field image, it lights up just the bias and none of the darks. Isn't that great? It's just, it's just so great. So that is going to be a very, very brief tour of WBPP. In the next section, uh, I need to explain just a little information about the various calibration types of, you know, how you use biases, darks, and flats, and so on. Um, and then having explained that, it will really help be able to configure these panels and get underway with WBPP very, very quickly. One last thing, which you'll see at the top right in very small print, are some of the people who have contributed to the development of WBPP. In particular, I'd like to highlight that Roberto Satori has most recently taken up this challenge to evolve and improve both the logic of the way in which the script works and how it communicates to the user when they are actually utilizing it uh, to do the processing, pre-processing that they need to do. Uh, I would highly recommend that if you see Roberto online or um, in other uh, situations, do uh, thank him for this work because I think that it is really uh, uh, an achievement to be able to improve a tool like this in such a significant way. I, as you can see, my name is there. I played some small part in perhaps influencing uh, some of the decisions that Roberto ultimately made and incorporated into WBPP.